The year is coming to an end, which means it's time again to look back. Not on this year, but on last year. That's right, today we'll be revisiting and reminiscing over 50 of the best board games of 2021. My name is Nick Murray, and you are listening to the Bite Wing Games Podcast. The wheel of time ever turns, and so it must come to pass that we revisit the very best board games of 2021. With more plays under my belt, and more distance from their hype-infused releases, I'm now ready to look back on all of the 2021 releases that I played. For those who don't know, this has become a yearly tradition, and you can still go back and peruse my reflection of the 2019 and 2020 releases. Those can be found on our website at BiteWingGames.com. With over 50 games to cover, I'll simply be offering my brief thoughts on each game as I categorize them into lovers, keepers, dumpers, flingers, or seekers. So first up, let's start with the lovers. These are the must-owns, can't-get-enough-ofs, top 50 games of all-time candidates, going through withdrawals if I wait too long to play it again type of games. While this is in no particular order, the first of these lovers is Redlands. If you can find it in my holiday board game gift guide, which we recently posted on our blog, then it's likely to be a lover. That's true for Radlands, which I maintain is the best two-player release of 2021. This is a dueling game that exudes confidence from its balanced deck of awesome abilities to its stunning presentation. Next lover, Equinox. While many of us wish that the cards of Equinox were smaller and more easily manageable, it is still an undeniably phenomenal card game. Those who appreciate tight hand management, akin to classics like Lost Cities or Arboretum, juicy shared incentives similar to Dogs of War or Cube Rails games, and moments of savagery reminiscent of the estates or Renature will find much to love in this betting game. Third lover, Kabuto Sumo. This one has proven to be more polarizing than expected, which is surprising given its lighthearted gameplay and gorgeous illustrations. I suppose that not everyone enjoys the challenge of predictive physics and disc pushing, but after thoroughly enjoying 16 plays of it since its release, I think it's safe to say that our household loves a rousing round of insect wrestling. Fourth lover, Oath. Oath has proven its longevity over the course of a dozen plays, and I've had so much fun with this one that it landed the number one spot on my updated top 50 games of all time list. Just because it's the best game for me doesn't mean it's the best game for everyone. This is one heavy, wacky, wonky design that isn't worth the trouble, unless you have a consistent group to regularly gather for it. Another lover, So Clover. After dropping three polarizing games in a row, Equinox's production, Kabuto Sumo's unique dexterity experience, and Oath's restrictive group requirements, perhaps it's time I behave myself and toss out a widely acclaimed title. While it only plays up to six, So Clover is unquestionably the best party game of 2021. I'd happily play this anytime. We got plenty more lovers here. Next one is Mille Fiori. While I've heard many folks praise Reiner Kinesia's 2021 release, Witchstone, and even rank it among their very favorite games of the year, I remain firmly on Team Mille Fiori. For my money, this is the better point salad Euro style big box Kinesia by a country mile. And word on the street is that it's soon getting an expansion. I'm very excited to hear that. Another lover, Kemet, Blood and Sand. Of course, Kemet is a lover. That's why it landed a spot on our 2022 Holiday Board Game Gift Guide. Kemet is still the gold standard for troops on a map games, thanks to its aggressive style and buffet of powers. Next game, The Siege of Rundar. I am five plays into Siege of Rundar and still hungry to give it another go. That's more than I can say for most cooperative games that hit our table. This one remains unique, challenging, and just plain fun. Reiner Knizia hasn't missed with his deck building designs yet. Speaking of Knizia, Whale Riders. Whale Riders has already been through some turbulent times, having never seen an official retail release due to the unfortunate conclusion of the Grell Games Reiner Knizia Vincent Dutrait dynasty. But that still doesn't take away from the fact that this is an enjoyably snappy little game. Between the gorgeous presentation and breezy gameplay, this one still makes for a refreshing filler. 
Another lover, Ankh, gods of Egypt. 2021 graced us with not one, but two epic Egyptian troops on a map games. Ankh is a triumph of a design that shows designer Eric Lang putting all of his experience to good use. Powers, minis, and events galore are polished to near perfection within this elegant system of tense competition. And here's the only expansion that made my lover list, Pipeline Emerging Markets. This expansion to Pipeline remains the best expansion of 2021 that I've played, and one that I'll happily integrate into every session of Pipeline. All the variety to be found here is guaranteed to keep you on your toes throughout this economic brain burner. We've got two lovers left, the first being The Crew, Mission Deep Sea. The only thing better than playing and enjoying one of the greatest card games of all time is discovering that its sequel is even stronger. The Crew, Mission Deep Sea takes the juicy core of trick-taking and transforms it into a playground of challenging possibilities. And finally, Arc Nova. Arc Nova was unquestionably the best heavy Euro of 2021. Designer Matthias Wiggy managed to weave together a tapestry of engaging mechanisms to create a meaty, satisfying zoo builder. I look forward to trying the newly released zoo boards as well as the upcoming expansion. Now, the jury's still out on best zoo game of the 2020s, seeing how our own Zoo Vadis is coming in hot next year. <laughs> Moving on, let's talk about the Keepers of 2021. These are the solid games that have survived many purges over the past year. I would be sad to see them go, but I don't need to bring them to the table constantly either. Starting with Into the Blue. Into the Blue is where Yahtzee meets area control. Sort of like King of Tokyo, but purified and condensed down to a more palatable length. It's not my favorite Kinesia Dice game, but it's absolutely a worthwhile one. Another keeper, Bristol 1350. Bristol is quite the fun little romp of racing carts and avoiding the plague. Folks who enjoy social deduction, a pinch of strategy, and a sprinkling of chaos will find much to love here. But between you and me, I've already tried the next game in the Dark Cities line coming to crowdfunding in January, and it's shaping up to be my favorite of the bunch. Another keeper, Well Riders the Card Game. This is an amusing little Kinesi card game of shared incentives. In fact, it might just be the simplest shared incentive game of all time. That interaction and simplicity is what makes it interesting for me. But I'll be the first to admit that this isn't Kinesia's strongest card game in his ludography, let alone from 2021. Another keeper, Cryo. I've really been hungering for another play of Cryo, especially after trying the comparably dull and generic Manhattan Project Energy Empire from the same design team. For my tastes, Cryo is much tighter much prettier, and much more unique. Where Cryo was a hit with my regular Euro group, I'll no doubt have the chance to play it yet again before too long. Another keeper, Llama Dice. I keep saying it, but I'm not sure anybody believes me. Llama Dice is substantially better than Llama. If a game is going to be simple, dumb fun, at least let it be a lively experience. Llama Dice is a dramatic and funny filler with enough clever Kinesian twists to be the one that I'd happily break out to start or end or break up any game night. Another keeper is Brian Baru, High King of Ireland. Loads of great trick takers have been released in recent years, but perhaps none is as ambitious as Brian Baru. Who even knew that an entire board game of area control and Irish jockeying could be grafted onto a trick taker? Pierce Sylvester knew, and he nailed it. Another keeper, Heckmech Am Kartenek. Perhaps it isn't as strategic as the crew, or revelatory as Scout, or unique as Cat in the Box Deluxe Edition. But Heckmech Am Kartenek is as solid as any card game out there. Take the lively auctions of For Sale, pour in the charm of Picomino, and blend it with the game of chicken hand management of Taj Mahal. And you've got yourself a recipe for fun in Heckmech Am Kartenek. Another keeper, Micro Macro Crime City Full House. We've definitely slowed down on our plays of Micro Macro since we first dove into the original game, but it's still a pleasure to crack open a new case in the system of Where's Waldo meets Murder Mystery. I still think it's one of the best cooperative couples games out there, and it'll remain a keeper for as long as we have new investigations to undertake. Another keeper, Art Robbery. Reiner Kinesi had a pretty great year in terms of his simple card and dice games. Art Robbery supports this trend, even if it doesn't light the gaming world on fire. This is what the undeservingly popular Take That Card Game, Cover Your Assets, wishes it could be. Fast, clever, 
and actually fun. Finally, last keeper on my list, No Mercy. Dr. Kinesia is just as good at providing dumb, simple fun as he is at conjuring brilliant works of art. No Mercy definitely fits on the dumb, simple fun end of the spectrum, and it sits about as far on that end as any game ever has. The title, No Mercy, doesn't even make all that much sense for what you are actually doing in the game. But who cares anyway? This one is a 10-minute guts and glory luck fest. For how unobtrusive the game is, I will happily keep it around for the occasional romp. Let's get a little spicy with the next category being dumpers. Some of these games made me question my life decisions. Others simply made me wish I was playing something else. None are welcome back at my table. So long and good riddance. May you find a better home. The first dumper on my list is deservingly Juicy Fruits. Juicy Fruits took unfortunate inspiration from the similarly named chewing gum brand in being the most dull and flavorless game of 2021 that I played. I suppose you can't fault it for being true to its title. Next dumper, Red Rising. I've rarely seen as much thematic dissonance between game design and inspiration as what I witnessed with Red Rising. <laughs> and the bland, messy design certainly didn't provide any damage control. If you want a true Red Rising gameplay experience, I'd wager you're better off trying something like Oath. And if you just need a glimmer of hope for a brighter day, then Libertalia Winds of Galecrest from the same publisher should restore your faith in humanity. <laughs> Next dumper, Sleeping Gods. Now, I like the idea and I love the look of Sleeping Gods, an epic solo or cooperative adventure game featuring lush environments and juicy narratives. But if I'm being perfectly honest, I find an actual fantasy novel or action-adventure video game provides infinitely more thrills and satisfaction with none of the board game baggage. Two excellent places to start would be The Way of Kings, which is a great book, the first of many tremendous books in a series, and God of War, the video game. Sorry, Sleeping Gods, you're just too much trouble. <laughs> Next dumper, Family Inc. Family Inc. is nearly the same game, actually, as No Mercy, which I've already categorized as a keeper. So, why did this alternate version of a dumb, simple, fun game end up here in the dumper category? One reason, because the size of this box is offensively huge. It irks me just so whenever I see it swallowing up so much space and carrying so much air. That disgusting mass of cardboard girth. I'm offended, my bookshelf is offended, and we won't stand for this. You are a dumper, Family Inc. Finally, Imperial Steam. Imperial Steam epitomizes nearly everything I hate about modern Euro game design, namely hollow player interaction, fruitless complexity, excessive mechanisms, piles of components, and obnoxiously endless rules, all in the name of appearing grandiose and replayable. Somebody give me the good old days, where the challenge of board gaming was to outwit opponents, rather than to pull a million levers in the most efficient sequence. Next, we're going to move on to the flingers category. Do you like to dabble? I dabble from time to time. These games were amusing to try. Didn't love them, didn't hate them, and sure, I'd play them again, given the right mood and circumstance. Starting with Furnace. It's been nearly a year since I played Furnace twice, and I haven't thought about it at all since then. That's never a good sign, even for a game that I enjoy. Yet it's still clung on within my collection until this week when I finally sold it. I think I'm hungry to explore the interesting auction mechanism further, but the other half of the game, cube pushing and resource conversion, didn't exactly ignite my enthusiasm to get it back to the table over other options. Another flinger, Coffee Traders. After still only managing to play Coffee Traders once, ever, it seems that the writing is on the wall. This one is simply too large, complicated, and long for its own good. Games this demanding on space, time, and energy need to be the absolute best in their genre, like Eclipse Second Dawn, or worthy of my top 10, like Oath, to merit the trouble of getting it to the table. While Coffee Traders was enjoyable to play, it clearly doesn't justify its bloat, particularly when plenty of other Euros on my shelf scratch the same itch in a fraction of the time and shelf space. Another flinger, Fort the Cats and Dogs Expansion. Leader Games gave us a charming little expansion for a game that I unfortunately lost my interest for. Similar to Coffee Traders, this one just proved to be too much trouble for its payoff. Although, of course, it's much easier to teach Fort than it is to teach Coffee Traders. But for those who remain Fort fans, the Cats and Dogs expansion is a no-brainer. Another flinger, Hibachi. 
I have a lot of respect for Hibachi. It blends a poker chip tossing dexterity competition with secret bidding in a theme where chefs are racing to complete enough meals first. What's not to like? While this game did fall victim to my culling urges, it's one that I'd happily play again if given the chance. Another flinger, Kemet Blood and Sand, the Book of the Dead expansion. The idea of a new power tile type in Kemet is certainly exciting, but if I'm being honest, I'm not likely to reach for this expansion next time I play Kemet. The main reason is that this power tile color doesn't integrate as seamlessly as all the other colors. It requires an extra board and set of rules. On top of that, our playgroup hasn't even figured out a winning strategy for these wonky emerald tiles. We simply don't play Kemet frequently enough to make this one worth the trouble. Next up, Railroad Inc. Challenge. Railroad Inc. Challenge is, in my opinion, the best version of Railroad Inc. yet. But Horrible Guild has been milking this roll and write cow for much too long. I realized this when the prospect of getting through the watermelon-sized box of Kickstarter expansions felt more like a chore than an adventure. <laughs> like any low interaction game or jug of milk, this one has a limited shelf life. Another flinger, Rift Force. Rift Force sadly didn't click for me, but I can at least see why folks love it. Rift Force does a lot of things really well. Hand management, card combos, and more. But a design will always be less than the sum of its parts if it lacks a dynamic game arc. Maybe I'm more sensitive to this than most, but I'll always come away underwhelmed if the opening, middle, and closing act of a game feel the same. Another flinger, Rorschach. Rorschach suffers the same fate as many other games in this genre. It's novel and amusing for a play or two, but the novelty quickly wears off. Before long, our group gravitates back to more compelling options like Decrypto, Codenames, Wavelength, or So Clover. Another flinger, Summoner Wars 2nd Edition. Now don't get me wrong here, this is a pretty great game, but I only ever play two-player games with my wife, and if she doesn't like it, then it's dead in the water. She's not a fan of dice chucking battles, and she's definitely not a fan of text heavy battlefields. Next flinger, Tutankhamen. Tutankhamen is a solid Kinesia design of River Traversal and Majority Set Collection, but it comes with enough caveats that I was okay with giving it up from my collection. Those caveats include that it's not as good at lower player counts, the god tile powers are underwhelming, the graphic design could have been cleaner, and the pace is much slower than comparable titles like Whale Riders. Another flinger, Sheepy Time. I've been meaning to revisit Sheepy Time since my first play of it, but it keeps losing out to other game night options. If my collection was smaller, then it would certainly be easier to get to the table. But the four-player board game genre is as crowded as they come. But I can easily see myself eventually pulling this back off the shelf and having a blast when I finally do. I think Sheepy Time deserves a little more time at our table. Another one, Super Skill Pinball, ramp it up. Super Skill Pinball suffered a similar fate to Railroad Inc. and Fort in that the game was better than ever in 2021, but my exhaustion for it became stronger than ever. Ramp It Up is a fantastic sequel to this faithful Roll and Write adaptation of Pinball. The only problem is that I burnt out on Roll and Writes, and after 12 plays, the experience started to feel the same, regardless of which table we tried. Another flinger, Mind MGMT. I feel like I should give mind management a second chance, considering how solid of a design it is and how popular it has been with others. The opposing teams are playing two very different styles of game, one of crafty hidden movement and the other of investigation and deduction. I'm keen to explore the psychic agent role of tracking down the slippery recruiter. Being the recruiter who sneaks around the map just didn't do it for me, despite multiple attempts. We still have several more flingers here, next one being Meadow. Meadow boasts one of the best productions of any game on this list, thanks to its vivid art of wildlife and nature. The gameplay even captures that peaceful outdoor vibe with a relaxing experience of tableau building and card drafting. But I'd be lying if I said it was more refreshing than actually being outside and enjoying the authentic sights, sounds, and smells. In truth, I love board gaming because of the lively competition and human interaction it provides and Meadow features very little of those elements. Another flinger, That Time You Killed Me. I've only played That Time You Killed Me once. It was a recent acquisition, so here it remains among my flingers until I can explore it further. At the very least, I'm intrigued to see where this time-traveling abstract game goes next with its cool premise. Another flinger, Azul Queen's Garden. Azul Queen's Garden sits in a weird place of being a better version of Calico, yet a worse version of Azul. Sadly, Azul has lost much of its bite in the sequels which sacrifice interaction for complexity. 
but Queen's Garden at least fully embraces that complexity rather than half-heartedly straddling it, like Summer Pavilion and Stained Glass did. I've still only played it once, but I enjoyed that play and I'm happy to try it again. Another flinger, Savannah Park. Speaking of calico-like games, Savannah Park is an interesting mashup of calico spatial puzzling and Tiny Town's bingo calling, and it might even be the best of those three games. It was certainly better than I was expecting. One should never discount the Dream Team design duo Kramer and Kiesling. Finally, last flinger, Witchstone. The best part of Witchstone is the hexagonal domino spatial puzzle that it steals from Ingenious. But everything else amounts to a toothless point salad that feels as un as I've ever seen. In many ways, it represents the growing plague of Euros that prioritize dopamine-inducing bonuses and smorgasbord minigames over tight design and tense interaction. Now, there's nothing wrong with the primary designer, Martino Ciacciera, catering to this fan base, as long as he doesn't poison Reiner's design style. Finally, we're on to the last category of this episode, The Seekers. I'm still open to trying these leftover board games from 2021. I've heard good things about them here and there. Of course, I've now had over a year to find and play them, so I'm obviously not that desperate. Although some are much harder to track down or get to the table than others. First up, Undaunted Reinforcements. Undaunted Reinforcements still sits on my shelf untouched, waiting to be visited after we finish the scenarios of Undaunted North Africa. Yet, now I find myself just wanting to play the brand new Undaunted Stalingrad instead, which I hear is the best of the bunch. It's a hard life being a slow-playing Undaunted fan. Another seeker, High Score. I've yet to play a Kinesia dice game that wasn't enjoyable. Even the borderline broken ones, like Zombie Mania, are still good fun. So High Score has been on my list, although it's hard to imagine this one beating out the somewhat similar and newer Gang of Dice, which might actually just be the perfect Kinesia dice game. <laughs> Another seeker, Crash Octopus. What could be more fun than flicking, scooping, and stacking up treasures in an angry giant octopus's swimming pool? Actually, I'm not sure. I haven't played Crash Octopus yet, but it certainly sounds like a riot. Another seeker, Don't Get Got, the Shut Up and Sit Down edition. Here lies the ultimate shelf of shame game. Don't Get Got seems like the perfect game for me and my buddies. Back when we were in high school or college and constantly hanging out together. Now that I'm a social hermit with kids, I have no idea when I'll ever get the chance to play this large group game of harmless pranks and hilarious hijinks. Another seeker, Cascadia. It sounds like the general consensus is that Cascadia is the favorite of the flat out game's puzzly drafting trio. It did win the Spiel des Jahres, after all, so I'd be happy to try it sometime, but I won't be going out of my way for it. The main deterrent for me is that Cascadia doesn't cater to any of my favorite aspects of this hobby. Another seeker, Cubitos. Cubitos, a push-your-luck racing game, certainly sounds like it's right up my alley. My only hesitation is that I've never found a John D. Clare or AEG game that knocked my socks off. Well, that was true, at least until I tried Ready, Set, Bet, which is actually a banger of a party game. Even still, Cubitos seems destined to be a game that I only ever play once or twice if purchased, so I'd rather not purchase it. Another seeker, Land vs. Sea. I've been trying my hand at several Carcassonne spin-offs recently, including Forbidden City and Carcassonne the Castle, so I'm certainly not opposed to playing Land vs. Sea, although at this point I'm pretty convinced that nothing is going to beat Carcassonne the Castle. Stay tuned for my full thoughts on that one soon. Two more Seekers here, the first being 10, if that's not a confusing enough <laughs> sentence for you. I've heard some folks say 10 is more convoluted than it needs to be, but I'm still interested in trying this push luck auction game from the creators of Point Salad. And finally, the last seeker and the last game we're going to revisit from 2021 is Turncoats. My copy of Turncoats has finally arrived this week, and blessedly I ordered it right before the shut up and sit down tidal wave of orders undoubtedly occurred. Of all the seekers on my list, this PAX Premier slash The King is Dead spinoff is my most anticipated game, because I'm a huge fan of PAX Premier, and this seems like an even simpler, more straightforward version of The King is Dead. So that's going to do it for our revisiting of the best board games of 2021. Over 50 new releases from that year that I've been playing and thinking about since then. While it's easy to get caught up in the game that's releasing next week or just released today, I think it's absolutely worth looking back to both celebrate the best games from last year and reconsider others without hype tinted glasses. That said, it's fun to wear those hype tinted glasses, and I'd say now's a good time to put them back on because our pre-launch page for Zuvatis and Gussie Gorillas launching on Kickstarter in January is now live. If you check out the link in the description of this podcast, it will take you directly to the pre-launch page for Zuvatis and Gussie Gorillas, where you can sign up to be notified the moment those games launch. 
Those of you who enjoy negotiation, interaction, cooperation, collaboration, and the occasional backstabbing do not want to miss out on these games. Thanks for tuning into this podcast. Thanks for supporting Bytewing Games through our publications. And I'm excited to come back for our next episode, which will be my first impressions of a bunch of hot new games. My name is Nick Murray, and you've been listening to the Bytewing Games Podcast. <laughs>